like I said, I was just I'm gonna start here with um, uh, more of like a review or like a, an overall summary, um, and hopefully in just you know in 10 or 15 minutes we can get into problems. And I have some prepared. Um, I have like six or seven picked out, and it's just gonna be um, uh, book problems. But at the same time, I ask for you guys' leniency. I haven't. Uh, I like to come really prepared, and I some of these I just thought, hey, that looked like a good problem, and haven't really looked at it. So we're going to be working through them together here. But um, also, maybe throughout the way, I'll ask for if you guys actually want to see a particular topic, because I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them. But um, so let's just start here. And welcome those who are watching this after work tonight. Okay, so... We saw this uh, the first day and in our last lecture too that this uh, a fluid mechanic of the fluid is a material that continually strains when sheared and what we mean by mechanics is the study of what external loading does on a material so putting this together what we've done here is uh, a rigorous study of the effects of forces on material that continually strains when sheared. And I think it's good to start with what we did in chapter one, but we're not going to be just, you know, going through chapter one after two. I want to draw some bigger links here between everything, and it's just natural to start with fluid properties. So the fluid properties are maybe the density, the viscosity, the vapor pressure, surface tension, uh, we can combine these two to get kinematic viscosity. Um, but this is truly our introduction to fluids back in chapter one. Then many chapters later, well, I guess really in chapter three is where we first said, well, it's not just enough to look at a fluid property, but kinematic properties as well, or the kinematics of a of a flow, which is where we introduce the velocity. And really the first time we really got into this in full detail was chapter four and then revisited it in rigorous in chapter six. Hello, obviously if we introduced Bernoulli's in chapter three, we talked about how um, fluids move, but we were most careful in chapter four. Um, and this is where we introduced acceleration where acceleration is the material derivative. Remember now this incorporates both local accelerations to fluid particles as they gain or lose their uh, you know, energy and accelerate or decelerate, plus moving into different regions of the flow where a particle can accelerate just because they've entered faster or slower mo moving regions. So this is just not a, you know, just a time derivative, but hidden inside here are uh, spatial derivatives as well. Yeah. We then have dynamic properties, so what I'm calling dynamic properties, which is really now relating to these, these forces. Pressure and shear stress, which are really the stresses on fluid elements, and then the forces associated with these guys. And uh, we introduce the idea of shear stress to, to, to talk about what a material is in chapter one, and then chapter two was really on the pressure and hydrostatic pressure uh, and then obviously we took it to a whole other level and we went to Bernoulli's and then onward throughout the rest of the semester, right? So what I'm trying to show here is where we introduce these ideas. Okay, but then hidden behind the scenes throughout the entire uh, semester's worth of analysis are three fundamental laws. The first being conservation of mass. The second being conservation of momentum. And the third being conservation of energy. We then had two general methods to apply these fundamental laws. And so what I mean by fundamental laws, this governs the, the mechanics of, a, of a fluids, right? And by conservation momentum, right, is, is F equals MA. Our two methods, one is a macro view of a system, uh, and the other is a micro view of a, of a tiny little fluid element. 
So this is our control volume approach, and this is our differential analysis. So our fundamental laws were chapters 5 and 6. And our control volume, well, we introduced what a control volume was in 4 and then applied it to the fundamental laws in 5. And our differential analysis was chapter 6. But really, that's, this is it. This is like saying that we should be able to make statements about the mechanics or the dynamics of fluid flow from these three laws. And we're going to choose two different methods to do it and uh, therefore tie all these properties together. Another key thing throughout the semester was making appropriate assumptions and uh, changing and how that affects these fundamental laws, what we're saying about a system when we make an assumption. <laughs> but if we don't make any assumptions, uh, the, the, the equations that govern fluid flow are hard to use, but we can write them down. Without any assumption, our fluid flow is governed by, well, from a macro view for a control volume approach for a whole system or a, a large a macroscopic part of a system, we have our three fundamental laws written like this. Where these really have the, the look of the Reynolds transport uh, pretty apparent. And uh, I don't know down here, this, let's just call it energy per volume integrated over the volume. And this is the, uh, there's an energy per volume plus some pressure term here hit by our fluxes integrated over the area through the control surface, and it's affected by heat and work. But uh, I don't know. We obviously don't, we didn't really use this very much. Um, so that's it. If you know how to, to apply that to any system on a macroscopic view, you'd, we'd be done. And if this was more straightforward, but it's, it's, it's extremely complicated. But in general, what we can say from this is that these quantities here are changes that occur to you know, our uh, properties that relate to these fundamental laws, the changes that occur within the control volume itself, and that these terms relate to the fluxes that uh, travel through the, uh, or the fluxes through the control surface itself. And then over here, are, are, are for the different fundamental laws, are other ways that we can get things affecting our, uh, you know, the system in, um, in the control volume. So for momentum, we can have forces applied to change the momentum of our control volume. And for energy, we can have heat entering or work provided through other ways that are unrelated to you know, don't come straight from the fluid itself. Okay, um, if we then take, if we shrink our CV down to an infinitesimal element, we are left with B, our differential analysis which instead of integrals over the control volume, our fundamental laws are related uh, through partial differential equations. And again, we have m we're not making any assumptions here. Here's our continuity equation written in differential form, or conservation of mass. And let's see, our second one, we're just going to do one of them. And here we see that material derivative again. Of uh, So this represents our acceleration 
uh, our total acceleration of a fluid particle uh, is related to a pressure gradient, a body force, and viscous terms. And uh, let's just write this as the, La the Laplacian of U. But these are Navier-Stokes equations uh, with similar equations in uh, Y and Z, or for V and W. All right, and, uh, well, I'm going to simplify this one. This is just a differential energy equation. So... That's about it. Again, whether we're talking on a macro view or a micro view, these fundamental laws written in this way are complicated to apply in general and actually impossible to solve in general, right? So, uh, uh, impossible should have quotes because if you can do it, you get a million bucks. Although most people turn that down. So it's kind of, there's, okay, this Millennium Prize is one of them. Uh, came out, you know, they, the, some institute came out with uh, uh, seven math problems that if you can solve it, well, you get a million bucks. There's precedent, one of them's been solved and he turned down the money. So the other six are uh, 16 years and running. He's actually a very quiet uh, figure in the math community. All right, so instead, what do we do? We consider various dynamical regimes. That allow us to make assumptions which uh, simplify these governing equations and the associated analysis. So let's consider all of those. My goal here is to uh, break all of these down from... So in these classes and in, in the way we learn the material and the way it's presented to you, it starts really simple and gets more complicated. Now that you guys have it all and have gone through it all, uh, now that you guys have gone through it all uh, and seen it all and been exposed to everything, let's start complicated and go simple. And now we can see, well, what, you know, how does Bernoulli's equation actually relate to real fluid flow? Or did we just make it up? How does this potential flow relate to, you know, I'm, I, my claim here is that every single thing we did in this class is in these is, is in any of these, either one of these. You can either do it from these three and then integrate it over a bigger control volume to go from micro to macro, or you can start with a, a macroscopic view but shrink your control volume down to an infinitesimal element and you get these equations, but everything we did in this class is in these equations and that's it. There's nothing much more. So we pretty much exclusively talked about incompressible flow where density was a constant. That's how, we, that's how we started it. This is an assumption on a fluid property, right? You know, we've, we're making a claim about the density itself. What this allows is that if we take the conservation of mass applied in a differential way, this then converts to the divergence of velocity being zero. So an assumption about a fluid property has a direct result on a, the kinematics of the flow. So that's pretty interesting, right? We don't see density anywhere in here. 
um, I mean, to get here, we, we, we said that this is true. And actually, these things are simultaneously true, or we are at least assuming they're true. Um, so it's hard to say which one defines what an incompressible flow is. Once we've done this, we can say that we could define a stream function this way. And that comes, that's a direct result out of the continuity equation with the uh, density being constant assumption. If we then take it one step further and, uh, and assume steady flow, right, so this is where all of these time derivatives in these general equations go to zero. Our conservation of mass for the control volume approach for the macroscopic view, well, that time derivative just goes to zero. We're just left with our fluxes in and out of our control volume must equal zero because there's nothing happening inside the control volume that can then change it. Often we'll make a uniform assumption that is that uh, we can, I mean really what we're saying here is that fluxes through our control volume um, Uh, this actually needs to be an A. Well, let's just go 1 over A. That's just to say that the regions where we have fluxes through our control volume are pretty well approximated by the average value. And as we went further along the pipe flow, we saw that that's not true, uh, if you think about pipes. But um, that's an assumption we make. And if we then therefore make, combine all these assumptions, so we take incompressible flow oh. I don't know if I can function with only three colors <laughs> it's so strange it's on the last I should have enough of red blue and purple to get us through here so that's crazy We make all three assumptions simultaneously. People are watching this are like, what is he talking about? <laughs> um, M dot, our mass flow rate is just uh, written here. And we can say that you know, this allows us to say um, the, the more simplified version of our continuity equation for our control volume is that the mass flow rates in, take all of our places where we have mass flow rate coming in, set them equal or they go out, um, or so the sum of all of the mass flow rates on the out, outflow sections. And uh, well, that's our continuity equation. And that's actually um, no integrals needed, and yet it's still a control volume approach. Uh, the conservation of mass associated with this, these all these assumptions, is also really nice, and that is where m dot times u for all of our outflow sections minus the mass flow rate times the velocities in the inflow directions must be um, all of the must be balanced by the sum of the forces on our control volume in that x direction, right? So where this is u, um, so this is our net momentum flux or the, the momentum flux we have leaving our control volume, the momentum flux entering the control volume must be balanced by the forces on the control volume. Key thing here, uh, well, first of all, we have, this is, a, this is really a vector equation. We can have similar for y and z, or we could make this more general by putting the vector in there. I'm going to leave it like this. Uh, and also note that our velocities here can be positive or negative. And I've actually said this in negative or positive. Greater than zero, less than zero. And then our conservation of energy in a control volume approach. Well, as long as we limit ourselves to stream tubes, we get to something that looks like this from our energy equation. And 
this is our energy equation along streamline, or in general, because we're in a macroscopic view here, this is A, we have, this is really like through a stream tube, but uh, for all intents and purposes, there's uh, no distinction there between the two. And we note here, you know, again, we introduced these topics as Bernoulli's first. It's our first go at that fluid's move. But Bernoulli's is really just this equation where we have no additional, uh, you know, shaft head or uh, head loss. Okay. Um, we got two more assumptions here to get through. One is inviscid. No frictional effects from relative motion of particles. So now that we have a, uh, you know, remember our shear stress is viscosity times this, or in a more general sense, as we saw later, the full shear stress is related to du dy plus dv dx. But what, what are we saying here, that there's no frictional effects, there's no shear stress? Are we saying that viscosity is zero? Are we saying that du dy is zero? You guys tell me, what are we actually saying when we make an inviscid assumption? You know, what, what, is, what is a fluid we're talking about that has zero viscosity? Well, there's no such thing. What is a, what is a, what is a motion where in the entire flow, there's in their du dy is just equal to zero? Well, that in practice, you know, in practicality, that's zero. First of all, almost every flow of, of relevance is turbulent, so this is crazy. But um, what we actually say here is, you know, an idea from our Chapter 7, Dimensional Analysis is that uh, we, have, we might have regions of the flow where viscous effects are swamped by the inertia of the flow. Regions of flow where viscous effects are swamped by inertia of the flow. And that's a dimensional analysis idea because we compare the strength of the viscous effects to the strength of the inertia of the flow. And in fact, all of these assumptions can be thinking about, can be thought about as, a, you know, a relative quantity, you know, a, a relation between two different physical phenomena going on simultaneously. So, I don't know, in general we should not make these, that's not what we're talking about. It's really a dimensional analysis that maybe Reynolds number in one part of the flow is bigger or less or whatever have you. All right, last bit here. Irrotational. The irrotational assumption truly comes from a kinematic constraint. This is a constraint on the kinematics. We haven't, and when we, when we brought it up, we didn't really say anything about the dynamics of the flow that produces this or the, uh, the fluid properties that produce this. You know, just like our inviscid, here's a fluid property. Are we making a statement about this? Are we making a statement about the kinematics? What are we making a statement about here? It, this truly, just like that, is a, is a relative thing, but you know, this is a hard uh, constraint on the kinematics of the flow. And in practice, it's really difficult to, to get something like this to occur. So. Um, if you can make this claim, we can have our velocity potential. But uh, I don't know, I guess the statement we can make here is that inviscid regions can have uh, irrotational flow fields, or things that look irrotational.
Maybe there's another important one here. Static, going all the way back. Now we're getting back to the really uh, early stuff. If we can just say our velocities are zero, well then our differential form of our momentum equations, so the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, just produce the hydrostatic pressure relationship, which, uh, if it's incompressible, produces Chapter 2. Okay, so those are all the assumptions. If then we back up and say, you know, not as many assumptions. We have our viscous flow limited to 1D. This was back, you know, like our Couette flow. I think there's an E in there. This was chapter six. We have our pipe flow. And as long as we are laminar, that's called the Coisel flow. Oh gosh, this is a hard one for me. Doesn't really matter, it just begins with the P, ends with an E. Uh, with some S's and L's and vowels. And then, uh, we have laminar boundary layers over, you know, for external flow, which uh, the Blausius solution, oh, sorry, that goes over here. The Blausius solution, and this is chapter 9. So this is now we're taking uh, less assumptions about the flow. And uh, these are complicated, or if we can't make these, you know, we see laminar, we see uh, laminar boundary layer. Uh, and this needs to be fully developed, our Poiseuille flow. Viscous flow is 1D. If we can't make those other assumptions, well, then we, uh, we use dimensional analysis. Otherwise, use dimensional analysis and uh, experimental data to relate our dynamics our kinematics and fluid properties. And so this is, uh, right, our drag coefficients, our lift coefficients, our friction factors, and our loss coefficients. All right, about a half hour in. Tried to summarize everything. I was trying to do it in two pages. It took four. <laughs> so it is with fluids. You guys want to do problems? It's like what we came here to do. All right. So having looked at all this, um, I kind of went through each of the exams and the, 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 the additional topics, you know, chapter 9 and the additional topics, there's six total review documents and sort of just picked out one problem from each. Any particular area you guys uh, want to see? Go way back because it's been a long time or start near the end because that's the most complicated stuff? Who thinks the, uh, I gave just two options there, go way back because it's been a long time. Do the later stuff because it's, uh, it's uh, more complicated. Oh, that's almost even. That's why we have clickers. Jeez. Huh? All right, so let's start. That means I get to choose. <laughs> 